constantly evolving. As time moves forward, things change, which is why it's important to stay informed. Throughout the year, there are dozens of professionals that share their expertise with the community through lectures sponsored by local government agencies and area not-for-profits. And each month, SLC TV will feature one of these visiting professors as they discuss the latest current events. So grab a notebook and pull up a chair, because the lecture hall is about to begin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Morningside Library. I really do appreciate you being here on Saturday afternoon at 2.30 p.m. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Ronald Grenville Fraser. Uh, I am a local historian. I like to uh, examine the local history of the area. Uh, I've done many lectures in this room at this library. Some of them, uh, uh, for example, World War II in the Treasure Coast, the Seminole Wars, uh, the Ice Indians, Pioneer Life, Henry Flagler in the railroads, the 1715 Plata Fleet, the military history of Florida in the Treasure Coast, um, Florida before Disney, yeah, before, and that's a funny word today, you know, Disney, but uh, my wife just went to Disney. She enjoyed it. Um, and today, uh, this is my first on the life of Zora Neale Hurston. I've touched upon her career. I do a, a lecture on famous Florida women, and uh, there's a section on, on her. Uh, when I first came in contact with her work, uh, you'll probably notice I have an accent. I'm from the South, Southern Massachusetts. <laughs> you got that, right? Yeah. You know, we park our car up there, you know. I never went to Harvard, though. Never went to Harvard. But uh, I was in Massachusetts uh, about 30, some, 30 plus years ago, and I was teaching an after, after school reading. Uh, and uh, they had materials uh, for reading. And uh, some of the readings were by Zora Neale Hurston. It was very impactful. And I said, wow, this is incredibly great work. And uh, it was about a young girl, African-American girl, growing up in a very uh, racial times of the 1920s and 1930s in Southern Florida. So I thought that was incredible. Then when I moved to, when I moved to Florida 20 years ago, and because I, I wanted to delve more into the local history, I found out that she uh, worked a little bit at uh, Lincoln Park Academy. I found out that she was buried in Fort Pierce. And uh, uh, another time I was doing a, uh, some research on oh, the 1928 hurricane. And then I found out that she wrote one of her famous books, uh, uh, Her Eyes Are Looking Down From God. And uh, that was also very impactful uh, about the uh, the African-American experience here in uh, South Florida. As I was doing my research, uh, I realized she, she, just, she wasn't just a writer, she was an anthropologist. She studied uh, uh, African-American folklore. And she traveled to South and Central America along her way. But today, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on her life. And uh, let me get going. This, this is Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, incredible talent of, of, uh, as a writer. I have the nerve to walk my own way, however hard, in my search for reality, rather than climb upon the rattling wagon of wishful illusions. Incredible quote. Incredible quote. She had some incredible quotes along the way. She is a world-renowned writer and anthropologist, as I said. Uh, she got into the the nitty gritty affairs of what how, uh, human behavior of African Americans in the South. She also wrote novels, short stories, plays. She was a playwright, uh, depicted African American life in the South. And she also collaborated, which I'll talk about with some of the other famous writers of the Harlem Renaissance. 
Her work in anthropology examined black folklore. She also influenced many writers, and we'll talk about that at the end, forever cementing her place in history as, a, as one of the foremost female writers of the 20th century. Her work is very popular today. I mean, and she, she has a, a, a collection of over 500 essays. That doesn't include the books. You know, this, this woman was always writing and collaborating. Zora Neale Hurston became a fixture of New York City's Holland Renaissance. The Holland Renaissance was this intellectual revival in the North, uh, in, in, uh, in, in New York City, uh, where all of these writers, all these African-American writers would descend upon. Uh, I mean, you have jazz music, you have the culture, the styles of the 1920s. Their eyes were watching God. To me, that probably is one of her best works. I'm not an expert in her best works, but from what I understand, it's based upon the 1928 hurricane that devastated Lake Okeechobee and all the migrant workers that uh, perished as a result of that, that hurricane. And uh, what, what's interesting about that is back then, you, you, know, we, you know, we have hurricanes today, but back then they weren't really prepared for it. Uh, the, the carnage and the, the sad thing is uh, the, the, a lot of the African-American bodies that they found, over 3,000, they couldn't identify. So they buried in a mass grave you know, in West Palm Beach. And she also had uh, shorter works like Sweat, she was outstanding folklorist, anthropologist who recorded cultural history, illustrated by her book, Mules and Men. You know, and it, the sadness, you know, she even worked uh, cleaning uh, as a maid in a cleaning service at the end of her life. She died in poverty in 1960 before a revival of her work and interest led to the posthumous recognition of her great accomplishments as an African-American writer. The Holland Renaissance was a phase of larger Negro movement that emerged in the early 20th century. Uh, when I talk about uh, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, the early civil rights pioneers of the time, we think of the civil rights, we always think of the 1950s. Well, this is also a period of the early civil rights movement and the struggles of African Americans, especially in the South, in the 1940s and 1950s. Also, the social foundations of this movement include the, the Great Migration. African Americans were leaving the South in great numbers. They're leaving sharecropping and debt peonage. They're going north to work in the factories, Chicago, Detroit, and even they, they even go west. They even go west. And part of that movement, all of that movement, is uh, you have the Harlem Renaissance culminating with the Harlem Renaissance. The social foundations of this movement include the great migration of African Americans from rural to urban spaces. And they brought their culture with them. The music, the jazz, the blues. This also dramatically uh, helped in the literacy rates the creation of national organizations and dedicated for pressing African-American civil rights. The NAACP, the Niagara Movement, you know, uh, lynching, I mean, that's, I mean I've, that's a reality of the South at this time. And they were against all of those uh, very bad things at that time. Sometimes they feel discriminated against, but it does not make me angry, it merely astonishes me how can anyone deny themselves the pleasure of my company? It's beyond me. <laughs> that sounds like Oscar Wilde. <laughs> he would say that. Oscar Wilde. <laughs> she was born January 7th, 1891 in Natasoga, Alabama. Uh, there's a little controversy. Her birthplace has been subject of some debate since Hurston herself wrote in her autobiography that she was born in Eatonville, Florida. We don't know for sure. 
However, according to many other sources, she took some creative license with that fact. She probably had no memories of her time in Alabama, uh, having moved to Florida as a, as a small child. She, she's also known to have adjusted her birth year from time to time as well. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you never ask a, a lady what her age is and they never move past 39, right? Am I right? Her birthday, according to Zora Neale Hurston, A Life of Letters, may not be January 7th, but January 15th, 1891. She was the daughter of two formerly enslaved people, so she understood that peculiar institution of slavery. Her father was a pastor, and he moved, very, he moved the family to Florida when Hurst was very young. So this is telling me she had a very good upbringing, she probably had to read a lot, uh, well read. Following her death of her mother, and her, uh, Lucy Ann Hurston, her father's subsequent remarriage, she lived with a assortment of family members for the next few years. So she was a lot of transitioning during that period of her life, her early life. Her family relocated to Eatonville, Florida, where they flourished. Her father became one of the town's first mayors. She enrolled in Morgan College, where she completed her high school studies. To support herself, and finance her efforts to get an education. That's incredible. I mean, this is a time where education was frowned upon for the poor and especially African Americans in the South. She persevered. She worked a variety of jobs, including a maid for an actress in a touring of Gilbert Sullivan Group. In 1920, she earned an associate's degree from Howard University, which is considered the black Harvard of the South, having published one of her early works in the university's newspaper. So this is where she got some of her basic writing experience. I like this picture. When in college, she was introduced to viewing life through the anthropological lens away from Eatonville. This is where her love of anthropology came in. She wanted to look at the main goals, uh, improve, was to prove similarities between ethnic groups. In 1918, Hurston moved, began her studies at Howard University, a historically black college in Washington, D.C. She was one of the early initiates of Zeta Phi Beta sorority, founded by four black women, co-founded the Hilltop, the university student newspaper. So she was involved academically and collegially in college. She took Spanish, English, Greek, and public speaking. In 1921, she wrote a short story, John Redding Goes to Sea, which qualified for, for her to become a member of Alan Locke's Literary Club. This is where she began. Uh, Charlotte Osgood Mason is a philanthropist. Uh, she has a lot of money to support aspiring young black writers who became interested, she became very interested in her work. She had supported other African-American authors such as Langston Hughes, Alan Locke, who had recommended Hurston to her. But she also tried to direct their work. She was an independent spirit. Here she is again. Mason supported Hurston's travel to the South for research from 1927 to 1932 with a stipend of $200 per month. Doesn't sound like a lot of money uh, in a, in, at this time, but that was a lot of money back then. From 1927 to 1932, uh, we had this, uh, this incredible uh, Great crash, where the economy crashed. So going into the Great Depression, she's still working and making money. In return, she wanted Hearst to give all of the material she collected about Negro music, folklore, folklore, literature, hoodoo, and other forms of culture. She wanted her to submit that. At the same time, she tried to satisfy Boas as her academic advisor. So she had two people. Bose was a cultural relativist who wanted to overturn ideas ranking cultures in a hierarchy of values. Can't satisfy two people. After graduating from Barnard, Hurston studied for two years at graduate student at, of, in anthropology at Columbia University, working further with Bose during this period. Now, 1920s is a period, uh, the Roaring Twenties as they call it, it's post-World War I. It's a time our nation wants to return to normalcy. 
And you have this renaissance going on in New York called the Harlem Renaissance. Just being around the company of people that she had befriended. She befriended poets Langston Hughes and County Cully, among several other writers. This is where they would collaborate. County Cullen and Langston Hughes. So her apartment during this time was a, uh, according to some accounts, was a very popular spot for social gatherings. Probably very informal. I remember uh, I've met Gertrude Walker many times. Uh, and uh, when she'd come out to the, the school uh, where I teach dual enrollment classes, Port St. Lucie High School, we'd talk about the black history of Fort Pierce. Because I, you know, in, in going into a lot more detail than I could ever probably research. Uh, Bean Backus, the great painter who uh, helped get the, uh, the highwaymen uh, going up in Fort Pierce, would hold these parties up at his gallery. And it was the only place in Fort Pierce that you would see blacks and whites commingle intellectually. And she said she was just a little, little girl at the time and uh, was probably, uh, uh, Hurston was probably in her 50s. And every once in a while, Hurston would show up at one of these parties. And that must have been incredible, you know, all these, you know, these intellectuals at uh, Bean Backus's gallery of African Americans and uh, other and Caucasians when, in a time where it was greatly divided up in Fort Pierce. Around this time, Hurston also had a few early literary successes, including placing in a short story and play, uh, playwriting contest an opportunity, a journal of Negro life. It was also published by the National Urban League. We've already read this. Uh, I have the nerve to walk my own way, however hard my search for reality, rather than climb upon the rattling wagon of wishful illusions. You know, when she moved to Harlem in the 1920s, she became a fixture in the area's thriving art scene, with her apartment becoming a popular spot for social gatherings, as I said. She befriended the likes of Langston Hughes and County Cullen, Cullen, among several others, with whom she launched a short-lived literary magazine called Fire. Along with her literary interests, she landed a scholarship to Barnard College, where she pursued a subject of anthropologies and studied with Franz Bowes, as I mentioned earlier. The Holland Renaissance was the zenith. That is the high point of art, art and literature. And she soon became one of the writers at the center of the Harlem Renaissance. Shortly before entering Barnard, Houston's short story Spunk was selected for the New Negro, a landmark anthology of fiction, poetry, and essays focusing on African and African-American art and literature. In 1926, a group of young black writers, including Hurston, Langston Hughes, Wallace Thurman, produced literary magazines called The Fire that featured many of the young artists and writers of the Harlem Renaissance. This, this is Wallace Thurman. Traveling into the Deep South, I found this story very uh, intriguing. In 1927, she traveled to the Deep South to collect African-American folk tales. She also interviewed Kajo Kazola Lewis of Africatown, Alabama, who was later known, who was the last known survivor of enslaved Africans carried aboard the Clotilla an illegal slave ship that had entered into the U.S. in 1860, and thus the last known person to have been transported in the, in the transatlantic slave trade. She writes the book Barracoon about this. This is Kudjo Lewis. The next year she published the article, Kudjo's Own Story of the Last African Slaver, 1928. According to her biographer, Robert Hemingway, this piece largely plagiarized the work of Emma Loudon Roche, an Alabama writer, who wrote about Lewis in 1914. Well, there's some debate about that. She did add new information about daily life in Lewis's home village of Bonte. She also intended to publish a collection of several hundred folk tales from her field studies in the South. 
she wanted to, you know, keep them as original as possible, but also balance the expectations of her supporters, uh, Fran Bowes and Charlotte Osgood uh, Mason, uh, the philanthropists, trying to satisfy them. This is Franz Bowes, German. This is Charlotte Osgood Mason. She returned to Alabama in 18, uh, excuse me, 1928 with additional resources. She conducted more interviews with Lewis, took photographs of him and others in the community, and recorded the only known film footage of him, an African who had been trafficked to the United States through the slave trade. Based on the material, she wrote a manuscript called Barracoon. Completed in 1931, Hemingway described it as a highly dramatic, semi-fictionalized narrative intended for popular reader. It's also been described as a testimonial text, more in the style of anthropology studies since the late 19th, 20th century. The story of the last black cargo, Barracoon, Zora Neale Hurston. This book is still available. After this round of interviews, Hurston's literary patrons, philanthropist uh, Charlotte Osgood Mason learned of Lewis and began to send him money for his support. Lewis also interviewed many journalists and local national publications. Houston's, Hurston's manifest, Barracoon, was eventually published May 8th, 2018. Barracoon, or barracks in Spanish, is where captured Africans were temporarily imprisoned before being shipped abroad. 1929, she moved to Ugali, Florida, where she wrote Mules and Men, which was published in 1935. Now, in the height of the Great Depression, the mid-30s, she published several, several short stories, Mules and Men, which was a groundbreaking work of liter literary anthropology, documenting American, African American folklore from the timber camps in North Florida. In 1930, she collaborated with Langston Hughes on Mules on Mule Bone, a comedy of Negro life, a play that never staged. This collaboration between these two great writers caused their friendship to fall apart. The play was first staged in 1991, many years after her death. This is Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. She also adopted the anthropological work for the performing arts. Her folk review, The Great Day, featured authentic African song and dance and premiered at the John Golden Theater in New York in January 1932. Despite positive reviews, it only had one performance. The Broadway diva left Hurston $600 in debt. You know, she really, a great writer, but she had problems in, in business. No producers wanted to move forward with a with full run of her show. Black folk expression. Hurston held a position similar to Locke about importance of folk plays, but she went further, suggesting that such plays should grow from styles and modes of performance found in rural southern juke joints, small town nightclubs, and storefront porches in an urban all-black cabarets. You know, you know, we had a juke joint in this area. You knew that, right? No. Conky Joe's was a juke joint <laughs> in the 30s. Yep. And her mimis, mimic, mimicry, uh, ostentatiousness, angular movement, and playfulness characterized black folk expression, whereas Locke, more influenced by the folk theater of Europe and romantic aesthetic theory, emphasized simplicity, poise, and formal symmetry. She also, made, she also produced short plays, made Broadway after being incorporated into musicals, Fast and Furious, and The Great Day, first performed in 1932. Her plays drew on the vast first-hand knowledge of rural Southern folklore and freely used humor and exaggeration in depicting everyday black life. In the 1930s, during the 30s, Zora Neale Hurston produced two other musical reviews, From Sun to Sun, which was revised adaptation of The Great Day and Singing Steel. She believed that this folklore should be dramatized. Hurston's first three novels were published in the 1930s, Jonas Gord, their Eyes Were Watching God, written during a field work in Haiti, and consider her masterwork in Moses, Man of the Mountain, 1939. The 1940s, 
Christian's work was published in such periodicals as the American Mercury and the Saturday Evening Post, which was a, every, that was a national, these are all national magazines. Her last published novel, Seraph on the Swanee, is, was notable principally for its focus on white characters, was published in 1948. While in Puerto Cortes, she wrote much of Seraph of the Swanee set in Florida. She also expressed interest in the poly-ethnic nature and the population of the region. Many such as Mosquito, Zambu, and Garifuna were, were a partial African ancestry and had developed Creole cultures, Creole cultures that you would see in Louisiana, African, French, and Southern. 1950s, she worked for a newspaper, the Pittsburgh Courier, to cover the small town murder trial of Ruby McCallum, the prosperous black wife of the local racketeer who was killed, who had killed a racist white doctor. She also contributed to Ruby McCollum, Woman in the Swanee Jail, a book by journalists and civil rights advocates, William Bradford Huey. This is our Neil Hurston's serif on the Swanee. The Smithsonian. The manuscript was not published at the time. A copy was, copy was later found at the Smithsonian Archives among the papers of anthropologist William Duncan Strong, a friend of Bose. Hurston's Negro Folk Tales from the Gulf States was published in 2001, as every tongue got to confess. This is the same quote, but I'd like to picture. Sometimes I feel discriminated against, but it does not make me angry. It merely astonishes me. Astonishes me. How could anyone deny themselves the pleasure of my company is beyond me. Early, early literary awards. She knew how to make an entrance. On May 1st, 1925, at a literary awards dinner sponsored by the Opportunity Magazine, the earthy Harlem newcomer turned heads and raised eyebrows as she claimed four awards. A second place fiction prize for her short story, Spunk, a second place award in drama for her play, Color Struck, and two honorable mentions. Throughout her life, she promoted the studying of black culture. She traveled to both Haiti and Jamaica to study the, religious, the religions of African diaspora. Her findings from all of this research and travels were finally uh, included in several newspapers throughout the United States. She also took some of this research into her fictional writing, combined it into the fictional writing. As an author, Hurston started publishing short stories as early as 1920. Unfortunately, her work was ignored by the mainstream literary audience for years. However, later on, she gained a following among African Americans. Hurston traveled throughout the Caribbean and American South and immersed herself in local cultural practices to conduct, conduct her anthropological research. The Parama writes, while researching lumber camps in North Florida and commented on the practice of white men in power taking black women as concubines, including having them bear children. This practice later was referred to as paramour rights, based on the men's power under racial segregation and related to the practices during slavery times. The book also included much folklore. Kristen drew from the material as well as in the fictional treatment she developed for her novels such as Jonas Gord's Vine, 1934. This is the book, Jonas Gord Vine. This book, this novel, published in 1934, tells the story of John Buddy Pearson, a living exaltation of a young man who loves too many women for his own good. Lucy is long-suffering wife and his true love, but there's also Mahaley and Big Omen, as well as a scheming Haiti who conjures hoodoo spells to ensure his attentions. In 1935, Hurston traveled to Georgia and Florida with Alan Lomax and Mary Elizabeth Barnacle for research on African-American song traditions and their relationship to slave and African antecedent music. She was tasked with selecting the geographic areas and contacting the research subjects. She was also part of the, uh, in, in the 1930s, the New Deal's Writers Project. This, uh, during the New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt put writers to work, put teachers to work, put painters to work, carpenters, bricklayers, you name it. Everyone had a job if they could work during the 1930s, during the New Deal. This is Arneal Hurston. 
again. Very stylish at the time. In 1936-37, she traveled to Jamaica and Haiti for research with support from the Guggenheim Foundation. She drew from the research for Tell My Horse, a genre-defined book that mixes anthropology, folklore, and personal narrative. As I said, in 1938-39, she worked for the Federal Writers Project, part of the WPA, Works Progress Administration, you know, putting people back to work during the, the, the New Deal, right? This is at the height of the Great Depression. Hired for experience as a writer and folklorist, she gathered information to add to Florida's historical and cultural collection. We see all the work that she's done, and she, you know, she dies penniless. It's really sad. Tell my horse. Voodoo and life in Haiti and Jamaica. From October 1947 to February 1948, Hurston lived in Honduras in the north coastal town of Puerto Cortez. She had some hopes of locating either the Mayan ruins or vestiges of an undis undiscovered civilization. She also established herself as a literary force where her spot on accounts of African American experience. We already mentioned Sweat, one of her early acclaimed uh, short stories, Sweat, 1926, told of a woman's dealing with unfaithful husband who takes her money before re receiving his countenance. A typewriter, I haven't seen a typewriter like that in many years. They didn't have spell check on them either. You had to get it right the first time. <laughs> Kristen also drew attention for her autobiographical, autobiographical essay, How It Feels to Be Colored, Me, in which she recounted her childhood in the jolt of moving to an all white area. That is a cultural, uh, breakdown. She contributed articles to magazines including the Journal of American Folklore. So she knew what it was like to experience racism, especially in the South. Yeah, just, just regular pictures. She returned to Florida to collect African American folk tales in the late 1920s. Kristen went on to publish a collection of these stories, Mules and Men. Black Southern experience, uh, as no white authors could, and uh, no one was more successful in doing this than Zora Neale Hurston, a native of the rural South who was intimate with black folklore as well as the modernist eth ethnography. Hurston departed from the scholarly ethnographic practice of the time as her literary ambition grew. This dialectical relationship can be noted between her ethnographic and purely fictional text. Upon receiving the Guggenheim Fellowship, she traveled to Haiti and wrote what I said earlier, probably her most famous work, Their Eyes Were Watching God, 1937. The novel tells the story of Janie Mae Crawford, who learns the value of self-reliance through multiple marriages and tragedy. The novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, treats the maturation of Janie Crawford through a series of relationships and dramatic experiences while using the free indirect discourse a mode of representing the character's consciousness from a third person point of view, but in an on, informal colloquial style seemingly identical to the characters. That melds vernacular language, the la vernacular means the language of the everyday people, and folk motives with a more standard literary voice. There are years that ask questions and years that answer. She had critics. Everyone has a critic. Although highly acclaimed today, the book drew its share of criticism at the time, particularly from leading men in the African-American literary circles. Author Richard Wright, for one, decried Hurston's style as min minstrel technique designed to appeal to the white audiences. In 1942, she published her autobiography, Dust Tracks on the Road, a personal work that was well received by critics, but she did have critics. In the 30s, she explored the fine arts through a number of different projects. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mule Bone, a comedy of Negro life, disputes the work. Disputes over the work would eventually lead to falling out between two, uh, between Langston Hughes and herself, and between the two, and wrote several other plays, including The Great Day, as I said earlier, and From Sun to Sun. A story of friendship and betrayal, Zora, Lank Zora and Langston, Yuval Taylor. 
Kristen was not only a writer, she also dedicated her life to educating others about the arts. In 1934, she established a school of dramatic arts at Bethune-Cookman College. Five years later, she worked as a drama teacher at North Carolina College for Negroes at Durham. Although Hurston eventually received praise for her works, she was often greatly underpaid. How did she feel about religion? Chapter 15, Dust of Tracks in the Road entitled Religion. Hurston expressed disbelief and in a disdain for both theism and religious belief. Prayer seems to me, seems to me a cry of weakness and an attempt to avoid by trickery the rules of the game as laid down. I do not choose to admit weakness. I accept the challenge of responsibility. Life as it is does not frighten me since I have made my peace with the universe as I find it and bow to its laws. This is her book, Moses, Man of the Mountain. In this novel, based on a familiar story of the Exodus, Zora Neale Hurston's blends the Moses of the Old Testament with the Moses of black folklore and song to create a compelling allegory of power, redemption, and faith. Obscurity, the period of obscurity. Hurston's work, unfortunately, fell into obscurity for decades, both culturally and for political reasons. The use of the African-American dialect as featured in Hurston's novels became less popular. Younger writers felt it was demeaning to use such dialect, given the racially charged history of the dialect fiction in American literature. Also, Hurston made stylistic choices in dialogue, influenced by her academic studies. Thinking like a folklorist, Hurston strove to represent speech patterns of the period, which she had documented through the ethnographic research. Contemporaries. Several of Hurston's literary contemporaries criticized her use of the dialect, saying that it was a character of African-American culture and was rooted in post-Civil War white racist tradition. These, these writers associated with the Holland Renaissance criticized Hurston's later work as not advancing the movement. And I, this is going back to Richard Wright. The century sweep of the, her novel carries no theme, no message, no thought. In the main, her novel is not addressed to the Negro, but to a white audience whose chauvinistic taste she knows how to satisfy. She exploits the phase of Negro life, which is quaint, the phase which evokes a, a pious smile on the lips of the superior race. During the 30s and 40s, when her work was published, the preeminent African-American author was Richard Wright, a former communist. Unlike Hurston, uh, Wright wrote in explicitly political terms. He had become disenchanted with communism, but he used the struggle of African-Americans for respect and economic advancement is both the settling and motivation of for his work. Other popular African-American authors of the time, such as Ralph Ellison, dealt with the same concerns as Wright in ways more influenced by the modern age, modernism. She was very conservative in her attitudes. Hurston was, at times, evinced conservative attitudes was on the other side of disputes over the promise of leftist politics for African-Americans. In 1951, for example, she argued that the New Deal economic support had created a harmful dependency by African-Americans on the government and that this dependency ceded too much power to politicians, although she was part of the Writers' Project. Although, despite these increasing difficulties, Hurston maintained her independence and determined optimism. But I have made phenomenal growth as a creative artist. I am not materialistic. If I do happen to die without money, somebody will bury me, though I do not wish it to be that way. Hurston was a Republican, the party of Lincoln, who aligned herself with the politics of the old right. And she was also a supporter of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington, uh, interesting uh, fellow, he, uh, was always debating W.E.B. Du Bois, and he said, uh, if African Americans are going to be free in the South, they have to be economically free. And uh, he gave his great speech in Atlanta, cast down his bucket speech. Remember that, Jack? And uh, 
cast down his bucket speech, he said, look, if we're going to live in the South, he was a realist, we're going to have to have the skills necessary to work alongside our white brethren. So this is when he established Tuskegee Institute, a vocational school. So she sided with, uh, with Booker T. Washington, whereas W.A.B. Du Bois, you know, completely different point of view. He says, look, all Americans, black or white, the Constitution should protect everyone. We don't have to prove ourselves. Uh, so they debated each other throughout life. But she sided, Hurston sided with Booker T. Washington. Although she once stated her support for the complete repeal of all Jim Crow laws, she was contrarian on civil rights activism, and she generally lacked interest in being associated with it. In 1951, she criticized the New Deal by arguing that it had created a harmful dependency on the government among African Americans, as she also argued that dependency ceded too much power to politicians. She criticized communism in 1951 essay titled, Why the Negro Won't Buy Communism, and she also accused communists of exploiting African Americans for their own personal gain. In her 1938 review of Richard Wright's short story collection, Uncle Tom's Children, uh, she criticizes communist beliefs in the Communist Party USA for supporting state responsibility for everything and individual responsibility for nothing, not even feeding oneself. Her views on communism, the New Deal, civil rights, and other topic, topics contrasted with the views of many other colleagues during the Harlem Renaissance, such as Langston Hughes, who was supportive of the Soviet Union, praised it in several of his poems during the 1930s. It's Langston Hughes. John McWhorter also called Hearst the conservative, stating that she is America's favorite black conservative. David Beto and Linda Royster Beto have argued that she can be characterized as a libertarian, comparing her to Rose Wilde Delane and Isabel Patterson, two female libertarian novelists who were her contemporaries and are known for the founding mothers of American liber libertarianism. Russell A. Berman of the Hoover Institute described her as a staunch libertarian thinker based on reason. The libertarian magazine Reason praised her claiming that what Hurston wanted in both life and literature was for everyone of every race, for better or worse, to be viewed as individuals first. <coughs> Makes sense? In response to black writers who criticized her novel, their eyes were watching God because it did not explore racial themes, she stated, I am not interested in the race problem, I'm interested in the problems of individuals, white ones and black ones. She's criticized what she described as race pride and race consciousness, describing as a thing to be abhorred. Suppose the Negro does something really magnificent, and I, and I glory not in the benefit to mankind, but in the fact that the doer was a Negro. Must I not also go hang my head in shame when a member of my race does something uh, execrable? The white race did not go into the laboratory and invent incandescent light. That was Edison. If you are under the impression that every white man is Edison, just look around a bit. If you have the idea that every Negro is George Washington Carver, you better take off plenty of time to do your searching. So she's more into the individual than as a group. She also, I found this very interesting, Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954, Topeka, Kansas, in a nine to zero vote. Supreme Court said it was psychologically harmful to have separate schools and separate, it was causing psychological damage to young uh, African-American boys and girls. So we had to integrate, forced integration. It takes almost 20 years for it to work, but uh, in 1954, it was a very uh, controversial case. She felt that separate schools were truly equal and she believed that they were rapidly becoming so. Educating black students in physical proximity to white students would not result in better education. That's what she felt. She worried about the demise of black schools and black teachers as a way to pass on the cultural tradition to future generations of African Americans. She does have a point there. Negro deplores the segregation decision. I'm sure that made all of the, uh, the newspapers. August 23rd, 1955, Richmond Times Dispatch. Letter to the Orlando Sentinel, she voiced this opposition in a letter, court order can't make the races mix that was published in 1955. Hurston had not reversed a long time of opposition to segregation. Rather, she feared that the court's ruling could become a precedent for the all-powerful federal government to undermine 
individual liberty on broad range of issues in the future. If I say a whole system must be upset for me to win, I am saying that I cannot sit in the game and that safer rules must be made to give me a chance. I repudiate that. If others are in there, deal me a hand and let me see what I can make of it, even though I know some of them are dealing with from the bottom and cheating like hell in other ways. Darwin Turner, an English professor and specialist in African American literature, faulted Hearst in 1971 for opposing integration and for opposing programs to guarantee blacks the right to work. Well, this is like 11 years after her death. I guess she can't re uh, rebut that. Even though criticized, Hurston appeared opposed to integration based on pride and her sense of independence. She would not bow low before the white man and claim adequate Negro schools already existed in 1955. For all her accomplishments, which are many, I mean, it was incredible as I was going through the research, she struggled financially and personally during her final decade of life. She kept writing, but she had difficulty in getting her work published. A few years later, Hurston had suffered several strokes and was living in the St. Lucie County Welfare Home. The once famous writer and folklorist died poor and alone on January 28, 1960, and was buried in an unmarked grave in Fort Pierce, Florida. Hurston's manuscript, Every Tongue Gotta Confess, is a collection of folk tales gathered in the 1920s was published after her death, being discovered in the Smithsonian archives. In 2008, the Library of America selected excerpts from Ruby McCollum, Woman in the Swanee Jail, to which Hurston had contributed for inclusion in the two-century retrospective of American true crime writing. Every tongue's got to confess. It's an extensive volume of, of uh, American folklore, as I just stated, a collection of her travels to the Gulf states in the 1920s. The bittersweet and often hilarious tales, which ranged from longer narratives, from God, the devil, white folk, mistaken identity, to witty one-liners, reveal, reveal attitudes about faith, love, family, slavery, race, and community. Together, this collection of nearly 500 folk, tale weaves a, folk tales weaves a vibrant tapestry that celebrates the African-American life in the rural South and represents a major part of Zora, Hurston's, Zora Neale Hurston's literary legacy. More than a decade after her death, another great talent helped revive interest in Hurston and her work. Alice Walker wrote about Hurston in the essay In Search of Zora Neale Hurston, published in Ms. Magazine in 1975. Walker's essay helped introduce Hurston to a new generation of readers and encouraged publishers to print new editions of Hurston's long out of print novels and other writings. In addition to Walker, Hurston heavily influenced Gail Jones Ralph Ellison, among other writers. Robert Hemingway's acclaimed biography, Zora Neale Hurston, continued the renewal of interest in the forgotten literary great. Today, her legacy endures through such efforts as the annual Zora Festival in her old hometown of Eatonville. Her book, Barracoon, was, as I said, uh, was the story of the last black cargo, was published in 2018. The book was based on her interviews with the uh, with, uh, old Olua Kosla, who enslaved name was Kujo Lewis, the last living survivor of the Middle Passage. Zora Neale Hurston. Toni Morrison, spanning more than 35 years of work, the first comprehensive collection of essays, criticism, and articles by legendary author of the Harlem Renaissance, Zora Neale Hurston, showcasing, showcasing the evolution of her distinctive style and archivist and author, one of the greatest writers of our time, Toni Morrison. This is, uh, this is in, in the paper, author Zora Neale Hurston who enjoyed fame as the foremost writer of the Negro folklore before she began writing articles criticizing the Supreme Court integration decision, died in poverty and obscurity in Fort Pierce Memorial Hospital near her birthplace. Writer of eight books such as Seraph on the Swanee, a novel about the Florida crackers, and Tell My Horse, a story about Haitian voodoo, Miss Hurston won two Guggenheim Fellowships and Rosenwald Fund Awards. Publisher Lewis Gannett once placed her in the front ranks, not only in Negro writers, but all American writers. A protege of novelist Fanny Hurst, she graduated from Barnard College and became leader of the Negro literary renaissance in Harlem in the mid-20s. Al How Alice Walker rediscovered Zora Neale Hurston, searching for the grave. Far along, farther along in her conquests, Walker felt drawn to the travel to the cemetery where Zora Neale Hurston was buried, the Garden of Heavenly Rest in Fort Pierce, Florida. Walker wanted to honor the writer 
who had been such an inspiration, only to discover that Hurston's unmarked grave had caved in and had been overrun by weeds and snakes. Once Walker was as certain as possible that she'd found the right spot, she purchased a headstone and had it engraved. She observed, there are times in finding Zora's grave was one of, the, one of them when normal responses of grief, honor, and so on did not make sense because they bear no relation to the depth of emotion that one feels. It was impossible for me to cry when I saw the field full of weeds where Zora is. Partly this is because I have to come to know Zora through her books, and she was not a teary person herself, but partly too, it is because there is a point in which even grief feels absurd. Zora Neale Hurston, a genius of the South, 1901-1960, novelist, folklorist, anthropologist.